Chris asked me to tee up a question to get him kicked off because I, I mean, honestly, like when I saw the roster of themes for this year, I was like, I got to call Chris. I literally movement. Um, and I have a really ding dong question. Why would you ever think to bring these amazing dancers to a hotel lobby in the middle of the afternoon and have them perform? I'm so glad you said that. And, and the answer is to have a conversation. Um, hi, everybody. <laughs> It's really wonderful to be here this morning. Um, I'm basically here to talk about my experience with movement, and uh, it's probably nothing new or that no one else has ever thought of before, um, but being a professional mover my whole life, I have a certain perspective on that. Movement is a conversation. Movement is communication. Yeah, that, that's a lot better. <laughs> um, movement is the original human language before we ever developed any kind of language. We were communicating with each other through movement. You all communicate through movement every single day. Yes, we need to be ambulatory to get from point A to point B, but it's how you choose to be ambulatory. Are you walking fast? Are you walking with intention? Are you walking slow because you really don't want to? It's our choices through movement that are communication. And of course, choreographers and professional dancers put those, those movements that are, let's say, that's a movement, all right? Well, that's a word in a sentence. Choreographers put a bunch of words together, and it becomes poetry. And it's how you portray and interpret that poetry as a dancer that speaks to everybody. I mean, all right, how many people in here either have children or teach children? All right, how many of you have done this? <laughs> really, everyone, I'm going to guess? You're dancing. You are expressing something subconsciously or consciously, you are expressing something, yeah? How many of you have danced for joy? Could you help doing it when you did it? There you go. It is the original human language. It is the, is the, is the language of the soul that is an inarticulable language through words. It really is. Um, I was fortunate enough to grow up backstage at the San Francisco Ballet. My father was a principal dancer for San Francisco Ballet. My mother had been a dancer with Ballet West, where I ended up dancing well, when my father was dancing there. And then they moved to San Francisco, and I literally grew up backstage. And I really, subconsciously, as a, as a young child, and then, of course, as an adolescent, consciously, I was completely ensorcelled by the concept of these amazing dancers on stage, but it... I, it went past the beauty of movement for me. I was so aware that something was being said. Something was being screamed out loudly to communicate, to commune with the audience. It, 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 it was fascinating as a child growing up like that. Um, anything, any, any human emotion can be, I believe, more clearly articulated through movement than through words at least in my experience. Um, and that's sort of my take on movement. Um, now, having been a dancer my whole life and the child of dancers, I am a very physical person. So maybe that's my experience. And I think a lot of people don't move to express. Um, maybe some of you are in this room. Now, I think a lot of people deny themselves the ability to, to move because of societal and systemic normalcy. Yeah? Isn't that amazing? That we actually deny ourselves the ability to dance for joy <laughs> because of what we're expected to do. Yeah? Wouldn't it be great if we could all communicate with each other more clearly? <laughs> anyway, so that's the start. I don't know, does anyone have any questions about movement or your experience with movement? I could talk a lot more. Give us, give us some more talk. Okay. Um, then there's the idea of collective communication. So in dance, we have you know, the solo. That's the, the basic form, yeah? It's you, you're dancing, and that's that. Um, and there's, whether it's dance for the sake of beauty or dance for plot, there is always intention. You know, and I think that's the most important part of any movement is intention. Um, and that's one person giving a soliloquy of poetry. Okay, and then there's group communication. Many, many dancers on stage, all dancing in congruity, maybe in canon, maybe in total synchronicity, but it's group 
movement. Wait, wait, hold on, let's try something. There's, I think there's eight rows. So one, three, five, and seven. Try this. Two, and, okay, hold on. One, two, three, four. All right, groups, all right, rows two, four, six, and eight do one, all right, so it's two claps up, one clap up for one, three, five, and seven, and then up, two claps, up, one clap, all right? So hold on, one, three, five, and seven, just only those rows, okay? <laughs> I'm giving you the basic version. There is footwork too, we're gonna do, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but no, collective expression, so I'm gonna count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We will, I'm just kidding, um, anyway, okay? And now, of course, two, four, six, and eight will do the opposite phrase, but hold on, let's practice. One, three, five, and seven. Five, six, seven, eight. Two claps up, one clap up. Two claps up, one clap up. All right, now, two, four, uh, two, four six, and eight, all right? Five, six, seven, eight. Up, and up, up. All right, now everyone together, but you gotta whip those hands up, all right? <laughs> Five, six, you got it? Five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Ah, see, look at all that. Yeah? Thank you, yeah? And just like that, no, you guys were amazing. We do it all day if you want. <laughs> But just like that, you became a core of dancers on a stage. And you were communicating something. That would, what would that take, 30 seconds, a minute? And there you go. So that's collective movement. That's collective communication, you know? And we do that whether or not we, we're thinking that we do it. How many of you have been out to a dance club and all dance to the same song? Or how many of you have, or have been with a group of friends and started singing the same song and dancing along together? It's collective communication. We are, we are communing in, by saying the same thing at the same time, all at once. And then there's my favorite form of movement. And this is what I was best at in my life as a dancer, right there, which was dancing with one other person, which was moving together with one other person. And I think most of us have probably experienced that in our life with another person in any form, through relationships, through colleagues at work, through anything, there is a simpatico that happens in, in any human interaction. And my favorite part of that simpatico is communicating without words. And I got to do that on stage to the nth degree with some of the best dancers and partners I could, oh, my favorite people ever. And when you are so in tune with another person that your movement becomes one, not two, then you are sharing that communication. You're sharing that humanity. You know, you, you have melded into one expression together. Um, and, you know, some of the choreography that you get to perform with someone else, a, a partner, your dance partner, it'll make you cry. I mean, the visceral experience of losing your, yourself into a piece of expression, um, so much so that you forget the audience is there. It's just you and your partner. And, and the, the way you're moving together and how you can anticipate each other's next step is really powerful. It's extremely powerful. In fact, it's probably some of the most powerful moments of my entire life have been on stage with one other person. And there's always a moment when you know you did it right, <laughs> when the dance stops and the music stops, and there's a split second for the audience before they start clapping, because everyone had to go, you know what I mean? And you go, yes, I got the point across. <laughs> yeah? it's, um, it's a powerful thing. You know, the human language, the language of our own humanity, movement, has been around for millennia. I mean, the tribes in Australia, the Aboriginal tribes, they told stories about where the watering holes were, where shelter was, where food was through dances before they had language. And those dances actually exist today. And that is the same all over many continents, the African continent, the Asian continent, you know, um, North America, South America. It's, it's, extremely true that we've been communicating long before we've been using words. And quite frankly, 
I think it's pretty hard to misunderstand body language and movement intention, but we always misunderstand each other's words. All right, questions? <laughs> yes? For someone whose movement comes so naturally to, I'm sure it's a lot easier for you to express yourself physically and embody your physical physicality. But for those of us who maybe have been still for a long time, mm -hmm. like, what are easy ways for us to, what's your advice for those of us who need to like free ourselves from that stillness? Well, I think the answer is twofold. It, uh, one of them has to do with if you feel more comfortable doing that alone or with others. Um, but I think the simplest answer is put on a piece of music and dance around your house. You know what I mean? And if you're not comfortable doing that, sit in a chair and just start bobbing your head. Lose yourself in the music, in the idea that the way you're moving doesn't have to have form, you know? I mean, how do we learn English in school? We learn a word and then we learn how to string three words together and then make a sentence with punctuation. And then I think it's as simple as just close your eyes, and bop, bop to your own music, you know what I mean? And your body is gonna follow. And if you feel more comfortable doing that alone, man, no one's watching. What do they say? <laughs> Let love like something, dance like no one's watching. We have a different phrase when it comes to the, the stage. It's <laughs> dance like everybody's watching. But, I mean, I think that it's possible for all of us, especially alone, to just, no one's watching. Just lose it for a second, you know? Get funky, do weird stuff with your arms, you know what I mean? We always have enough space to stand in four square feet and just move the hips, you know what I mean? Music always helps, yeah? Um, another thing that helps, though, is um, reflection. Reflection on moments of your life that either make you extremely happy, extremely sad, um, joyful, frustrated, and react to that. What is, your, what is your reaction to that, you know? To slump in a chair. All right, we'll put that chair in the middle of the room and slump so you fall out of it to the floor. Don't hurt yourself. And get up. That probably felt pretty good, right? You know what I mean? That release of, ugh. You know what I mean? That's another one. I did this one. How many of us did just fall into the floor in exasperation? <laughs> See, exasperate, okay, sorry, I'm gonna go off on a tangent. Exasperation, as a concept, exasperation means exasperation. I don't think there's adequate verbiage to actually explain exa exasperation, which is why this is communication, yeah? I really, I have to assert that. Um, go for a walk. Go for a walk. And I'm actually gonna say don't put your earbuds in. Go for a walk. And instead of getting down on what's next for your work or your day or maybe your family or whatever. Go for a walk and try to shade your mind away from that and open your eyes to what's around you. Oh my God, look at that kid with their puppy. Look at that bird and them flying, you know, and start to be aware of, of the world around you and then notice how your walk has changed based on your perception of what's around you and how that affects you. That's, I mean, my favorite, I, so as a dancer for 21 years in Salt Lake City, I almost never went to the gym for two reasons. I lifted people over my head every single day for eight hours a day for 20 years. Um, but we had the mountains. And my favorite thing was to get out and hike in the mountains and to be aware of my surroundings. And I noticed that my pace quickened and my joy through the effort of that hike increased as I was aware of what was around me and the, and the, the, the nature of the, the earth and the, the bigness of nature caused me to walk differently, to hold my shoulders differently, my length in my neck and look around. It's all, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it all starts here, don't we know? Yeah. Yes, sir. Sorry, Tom. 
Uh, my mom was a dance studio teacher for 25 years. Uh, she danced in the company, and then she taught probably 400 to 500 students over that course of time. And I've noticed as she's now in her 70s almost, she has a very complex relationship with her body. Uh -huh. So I was wondering, as someone who's older but was also in the field of dance for so long, how have you redefined your relationship with movement? Wow, OK. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> That's actually a good question. It's a good introspective uh, question for me, honestly. Um, younger movement is generally bigger, louder movement. It is less um, specific, and it is less, um, well, articulated. Um, I'm in charge of the second company. The second company is a group of 17 to 22 year olds who are at the end of their training journey, but before their professional journey. And what I see in the room most days is an extreme amount of effort without a lot of refinement and, and forethought. And that was definitely me as a teenager, as in my 20s. <laughs> up into my late 20s. Um, and what you start to realize through your journey is that that amount of powerful, non-specific energy hurts a lot. <laughs> a lot, a lot. I've had three knee surgeries and two ankle surgeries. And, and that's just basically the requirements of the career. I had to jump high and turn around a lot of times and land. And that's going to destroy the cartilage in your joints. But I also wasn't doing it with the correct intention, with the forethought of, and specificity of intention and the craft of moving, which is a lot easier on your body. And as you move through dance, you start to know your body. I mean, I, you know, if you say, kick your leg, all right, well, as you move through your dance career, it's all right, mine's about to go off too. Um, Instead of kick your leg high, you start to go gather the energy in your lower and upper rectus abdominis. Transfer down through the pubic coccygea as your pelvic floor. Use the adductors. Straighten the knee using the vastus. You literally feel the synapse travel through the muscle chain and out through the leg. It, it, it becomes a more intellectual endeavor the older you get. And as you get smarter about your own body, you start to learn how to be kinder to your body in the movement you're required to do. And then you get to a point where you're too broken to jump that high anymore, and, and this and that, and too broken to do that many turns. And that's when the ultimate intention, I keep tapping my microphone, sorry back there. Um, that's when the ultimate intention of dance comes out. So I can't. I can't jump like I used to, but I can sure make you fall in love with me. You know what I mean? By, by, by looking at you or just the, the gesture of, you know, like, do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's really the journey. And I hope that's what you were sort of asking is it really is the journey. And that's been my journey with it. Christopher, this has more to do with the creativity of the dancer versus the choreographer. And I'm curious about that, of like, let's say, a dancer who puts on some music and then just is moving. Mm -hmm. But now, they've got somebody telling them how to move. And if you could talk a little bit about that dynamic, about what the choreographer wants versus what the dancer wants, or can do, or cannot do. <laughs> and now we've reached the problem with human connection. <laughs> Is that everyone has different opinions about expressing. Um, it is sort of difficult, uh, especially as a young dancer, to learn that it really actually doesn't matter what you want to say with the movement. You are being asked to say this with the movement. And that's why we dance seven hours a day for six weeks to put on one show. It, it, you, you learn. Okay, 
Ballet technique. I was trained in ballet technique. I learned ballet technique. Plies and tendus. That is movement. How you do the moves, of course, expression. As a dancer, you know how to take those steps and move, like you were saying, put on music and just move. Well, when a singular entity is telling a room full of people, move exactly like this, exactly at this moment, exactly together, it doesn't feel like you're participating in true expression. And as you get older as a dancer, you realize that you are creating art. You are the stylus, you are the paintbrush, you are the, the piece of clay that the choreographer is trying to communicate with, to write poetry with. So then you start to accept the fact that you are the stylus, you are the medium in which that communication is happening, and you really start to accept this collaboration, this community within the studio of, of, of trying to repeat this person's emotions and intentions in a way that the audience suspends their disbelief and is right there with you. It, it's kind of an amazing process. Um, I, will, I will assert, though, that a dancer who just listens to music and is dancing around, they're choreographic every time. Now, sometimes you just need to move around, yeah? But I would go back to why do you need to move around? You needed to get something out, yeah? I think every time you put your, your earphones in and you move, you got to get something out. You got to say something, if it's a, even if it's to nobody else, right? Well, yeah, somebody else's vision is actually really hard to communicate. And that's why there are very, very few professional ballet dancers and professional dance, ba dancers in the world. Because, you know, you sort of get through the levels and you find who can communicate your message, really. So first, forgive me, define imposter syndrome for me. Um, the way that I would define it is where you might become overwhelmed or stuck because it's like, oh, you're great. I'm good. You're great. And that intimidation that comes. Like, you've never experienced it because you know you're great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> no. Um, you know, honestly, I actually see it every day. Um, and it's, um, it, it, I, I believe it actually stems from what I was saying earlier about our adherence to systemic normalcy and having to be a certain way versus allowing ourselves or being allowed to express, to move. Um, it is hard. I have been in the room with some of the greatest dancers in the entire world. And I, I feel like myself, I diminished <laughs> in that presence. Um, I've also been in the room with imposters who were supposed to be the greatest dancers in the world and felt diminished until you really started to figure out. And it's funny how you stand up taller when you figure that out. Um, it really just comes down to accepting the challenge or denying the challenge. You know, it really does. Um, and I think more and more, unfortunately, we are taught to second guess accepting the challenge. Um, and that is something that, unfortunately, is more and more common. But I think we're going to have to overcome if we're going to truly speak to each other. Um, but yeah, imposter syndrome is, is weird. It's actually really strange to be a part of. It's happened to me. I've seen it happen a million times. What part of your question am I supposed to answer, though? Because... <laughs> yeah. I mean... I, okay, so this is gonna sound hugely arrogant, but I've actually seen people do that in the room with me. Um, it happens a lot when, if I'm choreographing a piece on the second company, and I show movement, and I turn around and I go, okay, who's got it? And they'll sort of look at me like, and I realize that 18 year olds didn't have a 25 year dance career, <laughs> you know, and they're seeing somebody move in a fullness or to an extent that they hadn't really even considered before. Some of them have, definitely some of them have. And it almost immediately makes them afraid to even try it, to show what they thought they saw, because they don't want to look the fool. Ah, see, aren't we all afraid of looking the fool? Isn't that the, way, the reason we don't dance for joy? Isn't, yeah, right? So that is one of the things we're trying to create in the studios at Kansas City Valley as a safe space to lose that worry about feeling foolish and looking foolish and just dance. 
no matter who you are, no matter what you look like, dance, show us something. Our artistic director is so much more interested in feeling something from the dancers than seeing objective beauty and a million turns and high jumps. Now, that is a compulsory requisite of ballet, but what transcends to the audience, what, what again, suspends the disbelief is the letting go of, I feel like I'm gonna look like a fool and exposing your soul. Yeah, and that's, I think that's the divide, that's the barrier. Yeah, it's, re it's really hard. Sometimes I stand up and dance with them. Come on, let's move together. Sometimes I'll fall on the floor and look like an idiot to make, to loosen the mood, to make everyone, re I'll, I'll show videos of me totally screwing up on stage, like really bad. Um, just the ability, uh, sorry, not the ability, the, the message that we're all human and we all come from the same place and, and that there's no foolishness involved here. In fact, we say a lot. Um, Devin Carney says this, I say this a lot. You need to, you need to want to make a fool of yourself because then it is genuine. And genuine, you know, really true authentic intention and movement is what moves an audience, is what moves society when we talk to each other through movement, yeah? Okay, um, no, you know, social movement is actually my favorite kind because it is unchoreographed. I think this is what we're getting at, right? Um, however, an unchoreographed social movement becomes synchronized. It becomes a collective expression. It's almost a spontaneous collective expression. Write that down, can I have that on a t-shirt? Um, and that's my favorite part about social moving, about when we go out and there is no set boundaries or structure or choreographer. Um, and then you have choreographers choreograph a group movement. Um, and my favorite part of that is to, yes, have an idea, but then look at the room and see what the difference is in each person and what starts to show through in that. And oh, that was great the way you did that. Everyone look at that. Wait a second, that next part's great the way you did that. Everyone look at that. Let's try this this way. And it becomes almost a community of choreography inside of the room. Yeah, that's at least the way I like to do group movement. But um, no, social movement's my absolute favorite. You know? The undefined that becomes defined. It really does every time. It's amazing. Look at a dance club. <laughs> you know? Uh-huh. Ooh, that mirror. <laughs> I'm so glad you asked that question, Mark. Um, I call, well, definitely ballet, but most professional dance, uh, or the endeavor of becoming a professional dancer or being a professional dancer, I call it the race without a finish line. 
it's there is no such thing as perfect. I think we all know that by now. There just is no such thing. Once in a blue moon, you come across a, an event or a thought or a, a moment that gets close, but there is no such thing as perfect. And the juxtaposition in at least the ballet world, in my experience, is we are constantly being asked to look perfect, to dance perfectly together, to be perfectly in line. For literally, that f finger needs to be, I'm not kidding about this, by the way. <laughs> um, and you're never gonna get there. You're literally never gonna get there. You can try, and that's what makes you a professional dancer, is trying to achieve perfection that is never there. That bar keeps getting set far, that finish line is farther and farther away every time you get there. So it is a race without a finish line. And it is, oh, you gotta love it. You gotta love it or, or, or you gotta leave. <laughs> and you know, it's, and I think in that sense, it's very much like family or a relationship. It's, you, you, if you love it, then you're in it. And you hate it sometimes, but you still love it. Yeah, but if you don't love it, it's really, it's hard to keep going because there is, I would say the proportion is about, I'll be generous, 70% disappointment to 30% enjoyment. But that 30% means so much more. <laughs> yeah, and this is very specifically as a, ba a professional ballet dancer. And I'm really talking about the world of ballet. I'm not talking about here specifically or where I used to dance. Um, yeah, the, <laughs> the constant striving. And I think that's also what makes it such an electric art form is the dancers themselves are constantly striving for better every single time. I do not know a dancer that I've ever seen on stage that hasn't come off stage and gone, oh, I could have done that better every single time. And that is what drives the art form and the hunger to achieve a level of beauty through communication that is astonishing. Again, suspending the disbelief of the audience. Um, yeah, it's a race without a finish line for sure. Um, and it, oh God, it hurts. Because you're constantly trying to jump higher and do more and you know throw your partner higher and it, you know, it hurts. <laughs> um, and be more perfect. I think we have time for one more. Apologize for this being a pain. Yeah. Sorry, what? Oh. Um, satisfaction, enjoyment. What did I say? I don't know. Can we roll the tape back? <laughs> The tape, I said tape, that betrays how old I am. Um, you know, somebody did say that to me when I was about 20 years old, and I really wasn't listening. <laughs> but I think that's also sort of part of my nature of, of always thinking, no, it's gonna be perfect. I can be perfect, you know, of course, you know, your adolescence. You know, I mean, how many people know or live or teach teenagers? And teenagers know everything. I mean, they are sure they know everything. And then you grow up and you figure out you don't. Um, but yeah, the, the race without the finish line, without a finish line is 70% disappointment and 30% fulfillment. But that 30% is so sweet. Yeah, and I think it's the same in life too. You know, and when, it, and when you get to that 30%, dance for joy. And who cares who's watching? Thank you. Um, we one more. One. Mm. Great question. You're talking about the difference between George Balanchine and Merce Cunningham. <laughs> um, George Balanchine famously made music visual. Uh, one of the greatest examples of that is his ballet Serenade, which is set to Tchaikovsky's Serenade in Strings. Uh, Serenade Four Strings. I can't remember what key it's in. Um, and it quite literally is music made visual. There is not 
a perceptible difference between the music and the dance. Um, and Balanchine was known for being basically a genius at making musical movement. Merce Cunningham was a genius at making mus uh, a movement, but it had very little to do with the music. The music was almost a backdrop to the movement. Um, my experience with music is funny. Um, you know, I grew up around all kinds of music, of course, my whole life. Um, certain classical pieces of music, I can literally only see one way, because that's what I've only seen for that music. But when I started to choreograph, the, the music spoke to me. It was always the music first, you know? And it wasn't every piece of music. All of a sudden, I'd hear a piece of music, and I'd just see movement, and I'd go, uh-oh, a new ballet just started. And um, the, 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 I don't want to say marriage, the, the coalescence of choreographer and music is unique to each choreographer, but for me, the music told the story. I just interpreted it through my movement, my expressive movement. Um, and then that changed. I, um, towards the end of my career, the last half of my career, um, I did a ballet called Great Souls. And I've been wanting to do this ballet for a long time. And I don't know, we've probably all lost people in this room. And some of them have been great. Great Souls is what I call them. It's a, actually a, a poem by Maya Angelou called Great Souls. And I, it was, I needed to express what it was like to lose a great soul. Uh, and I used Beethoven. I don't know why I used Beethoven. He was uh, previously my favorite classical composer. But that instance, the story was already there. I knew what I needed to say. The music had the intensity to marry what I wanted to say with music on stage. The, the, the desperate longing for that soul to be back, the search for understanding, it said it through that music. So that, in that sense, it very much came together at the same time. Now, I, I think it happens differently for every choreographer, but in the beginning, it was very true. I, the music told me what the steps were, and that's where it started. Um, I don't know, it's interesting. That's actually a conversation over a cup of coffee because um, there's a lot to say about it in the whole journey. Yeah, yeah. All right, we are coming up on time. Um, how we, do we have can I see I want to. I want to throw the last question to Chris, and this is a total layup, um, and and share a thirty-second story. Um, this guy came to me five years ago and said, "Hey, I want to do something goofy here in the hotel." And I was like, "Okay, sure." And so, over a handful of cocktails, we decided to bring the second troop and let them dance in the atrium goofiest thing we've ever done in a hotel. I can't believe that the Kansas City Ballet is actually dancing in our space. Um, and it's all because of this guy. Um, I think that when we put educators and teachers on this stage, he could stand up here for four hours and talk to you guys. And you guys had amazing questions today. Um, so my final question is, again, a big old fat layup. What's next for the ballet? How can these guys support? How can we follow along? <laughs> um, well, the biggest way you can support the ballet is buy a season subscription and come to the ballet. Um, there's, you know, there's, uh, there's several groups associated with the ballet, the Bar Association, the ballet, the Kansas City Ballet Guild, things like that. But truly, your, your patronage at the performance is, is the way to support the ballet, to support dance. And please, don't just support Kansas City Ballet. Support the symphony, support Quixotic, support any dance, you know, uh, Owen Cox, uh, any, you know, dance group here. Um, but, you know, truly, the ballet exists based on the generosity of others, uh, both uh, corporate groups and individuals. And should you be of the means and so moved, it would be an amazing thing to go to kcballet.org and just look at the different ways you could contribute past, you know, a visit to the website or a, one ticket in one season. It really, you know, and then you start to see a story unfold. You really do. And you also start to see the the story of dancers' lives unfold on stage. You start to see them grow and perform in new and better ways that really start to 
have a clearer conversation with the audience. It's kind of amazing. So go and then come back. <laughs> Oh, well, and of course, the next show. OK, thanks, Mark. Um, our next show is at the Coffin Center. Uh, I think we open on May 12th. Um, it is called Bliss Point. It is a, a repertory evening of three different works, master works by three incredible choreographers. Um, we, I don't know the order off the top of my head. But uh, one of them is a piece by Yuri Killian, um, an amazing Czech choreographer who started in uh, Germany in the 70s and is widely recognized as one of the greatest choreographic, choreographic minds of his generation. Uh, Mark Morris, uh, Sandpaper, which is an out there, weird, awesome, awesome ballet that is, um, <laughs> come see it, I'll let you choose for yourself what it means. And um, then something called Cacti by Alexander Ekman, which is thoroughly different and completely unexpected and utterly worth seeing. It is, uh, it's probably the most eclectic um, grouping of style and movement and performance art in one piece of ballet in 35 minutes that I've ever seen. Um, rhythm sections, uh, tongue and cheek comedy, um, you know, vigorous dancing, uh, spoken word. It's quite amazing. Um, and that happens at the Coffin Center May 12th until the 21st. Chris Thanks, coming. Jeremy. Oh, yeah, thanks. <laughs>